Uh, good afternoon. I am uh, Jean-Louis Van Bella. I have uh, presented myself in, uh, in previous videos, so I won't do that again. Um, I'm going to do what is probably really my last lecture. Um, it's, it's some loose ends, things I didn't cover um, in, in, in previous lectures and, and things uh, that sort of, are, I mean, if you, if you look at this, this is what I call a realist interpretation of quantum mechanics, sort of a, a classical explanation of all these uh, guru-like uh, mystery uh, explanations, you know, entanglement and uh, what have you. Um, so I, I want to point out, uh, you know, a few of, uh, it's not weaker points, but things that I haven't completely worked out, uh, including, you know, um, this, uh, this 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 typical experiment uh, which you will um, uh, which you will have heard of when when you studied an online course on quantum mechanics, um, Max Zender interference, uh, even with one photon at a time, um, you know this weird interference you get, or um, the original experiment um, which Feynman presents so well, you know you have one or two slits and you send electrons through them, and then you also get like an interference pattern. Um, just like um, you would have water going through one or two slits, and um, and all this is sort of explained in terms of you know quantum mechanical probability amplitudes, which are related with the trajectories and this and that. Uh, nothing, none of these explanations sort of uh, think uh, well. You know, the proton and the photon maybe they have a structure, and uh, especially an electron or um, or a proton, they have a magnetic moment, so maybe there's some interaction with the, the electromagnetic fields and the material of the slit. All these kind of things. So I, I will talk about that. Um, mainly, uh, this 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 uh, lecture was also triggered by uh, some something that made me. Um, you know, I've been accused of being like a bit of a crackpot theorist, uh, uh, and that my formulas, you know, were like a bit of numerology and this and that. And I'm going like, um, um, look at this guy, John Clauser, a PhD in physics, uh, last year, 2022. So he got a Nobel Prize in Physics in, uh, for, for his contributions to the, this, this theory of entanglement. Now, for me, the entanglement, okay, fine. Um, it, it's sort of a weird thing, but for me, it's not so weird. Uh, if you have a particle or, you know, some, some system, I would say, which has a, you know, a combined angular momentum or, or, or magnetic moment or whatever property you can think of. And for some reason, the system is made up such that you can like split it into subsystems, right? Then the, the law of conservation of linear momentum, angular momentum, energy, uh, you know, it will, it will um, you know, when you take these two things apart, let's say um, it's like a photon. I mean, <laughs> I actually do believe that, you know, a circular, a circularly polarized photon, um, that you can sort of look at it as a, as a superposition of two linearly polarized photons with different phase. I will come back to that. But let's suppose you can do that sort of, a, you know, circularly polarized photon. We split it in, you know, two linearly polarized things. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the, the law of conservation of, of, of linear and angular momentum will dictate that, uh, you know, if we had a spirozin or a spiro one. Uh, spin uh, one uh, particle and you split it in two, you know, um, the spin will be opposite. Um, you know, the, 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 the uh, one, if, if we measure one to be up, the other one will be down. And if we measure the other one to be up, then the, 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 the first one will be down. So this phenomenon of entanglement for me, where, you know, at a large distance from each other, where you do a simultaneous measurement of something that has indeed been entangled because, you know, it happened to be part of the same system. Um, the fact that the properties, you know, will be um, verified and, and have certain values that are opposite to each other, uh, you know, that has nothing to do with, um, you know, um, spooky distance, spooky action at the distance, as Einstein called it. But so to go back to this guy, he's got a PhD in physics, all right? And he got a big Nobel Prize, it's a lot of money, and now he's part of the CO2 coalition. And I read what he's, what we, what he's writing. His suggestion is, I mean, he first sort of, um, you know, he's not a climate change scientist, so he may be a very good academic physicist, but he surely is a crack post climate change. He denies it that it happens. And if it happens, you know, if climate change would be real for some reason, uh, I'll show you it's damn real, then, um, you know, we can, uh, we can probably do some geoengineering. He talks about, you know, we need more white clouds because white clouds, they reflect 
uh, the sunlight and uh, and so that will make the planet less hot and I'm going like well if we have more white clouds you know they will also reflect from the bottom the heat that comes out of the surface of our earth so uh, we will also more um, uh, absorb back the own uh, you know the heat that is being generated and radiated from 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 our earth's uh, surface so um, basically the earth is is a, is a system in terminal equilibrium and that thermal equilibrium has changed the the planet got hotter by by about two degrees uh, uh, since 1850 i will show that on the graph and uh, so the thermal equilibrium of our planet has changed and you're not gonna well of course your white clouds are going to change uh, <laughs> that that thermal equilibrium uh, again you know it's going to change the balance of the energy that gets absorbed and the energy that gets emitted out but um, yeah, it's not going to do it's going to do shit for uh, to, to combat climate change and this is where i'm um, a little bit aggressive and thought like um, you know in any case i'm done with physics and i'm done with my theories but um, you know if, if people say you know you're a crackpot theorist or you know your, your things haven't been peer reviewed or you didn't publish in journals um, which which is true um, i'm going like um, well i had a lot of interesting discussions with people that are smart not necessarily don't publish in journals either and uh, who say like you know your, your stuff makes sense and I publish on an open science uh, forum, ResearchGate, and you know I've got you know 40, 50,000 reads there, and I shut up in a couple of years, you know, to the top one percent of of uh, you know um, papers that are being read on that forum, and uh, and so here we have a guy who basically you know has a PhD, in physics, Nobel Prize winner, and who says you know the or the Earth is not getting any hotter, it's sort of a random, um, you know, you must be joking, right? We, we measured starting sort of from 1850 uh, and uh, and now we are here and it, it's gone up a full two degrees and um, you don't need to be a scientist to know that climate change is real i live in belgium you know when i was a kid uh, i could go skating on average every two or three years on the canals in Bruges, the, the canal from Bruges to Sluis or to Holland, uh, the Alfstedentocht in Holland, uh, you know, it would take place every two, three, four years. Uh, it hasn't happened, I think, in the last 20, 30 years that we could go out in the open and skate. So our winters have become warmer. Um, we, we do have more weird phenomena, hurricanes, uh, cloud bursts in, in the Himalayas. Um, irregular monsoons and what have you uh, we don't have more victims necessarily because that these people try oh we don't have more people killed or dying or wounded or displaced from from natural disaster um, no that's true probably because f we are maybe to some extent better prepared to natural disaster than we were 30 years ago but in any case the fact that we have more irregular weather phenomenon and that it's linked to the second thing that is shown here you know never since um, the earth became inhabitable to animals to us uh, you know we've seen this huge um, rise in uh, you know the in, in greenhouse uh, gases in our atmosphere and so these two are correlated and you know I did econometrics and and I'm the first one to say like you know a strong correlation is not necessarily you know directly a, a causal relationship but then you need to you know maybe it's a spurious correlation maybe it's correlation as we call it cor correlated correlation uh, in the sense that there's an underlying variable you know that is strongly correlated with the the, the 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 things we are measuring here in this case you know the temperature rise and and these carbon emissions but um i don't see any other candidates huh and uh, and i said uh, for me it is sort of mind numbing and i think the nobel prize committee in in oslo should think about this that this guy comes out um is taken seriously by a lot of people and uh, and can say uh, can talk this nonsense maybe he's a very good academic uh, uh, i said you know uh, i i criticize and i will say well, why i criticize some of the nobel prizes but um it has nothing to do with this this is a guy who comes out of one scientific field goes into another of which he has no knowledge and sort of because of respectability and uh, what's the peer review here that he's basically on the board of his institute with 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 some other crooks trying to deceive uh, people into well you know climate change is, is not happening or if it's happening it's not as bad as it seems and whatever i'm the first one to say 
that it's not as bad as uh, the UN Secretary General sort of, um, you know, these words, you know, we went from global warming to global heating, and now we're in the global boiling. No, we're, we're not boiling, no, no way, no way near, but it's, it's getting worse and we should be prepared. And we are talking now climate change mitigation, climate change preparation, um, disaster preparedness, all these kind of things. And that should get serious investment, a lot more than, uh, you know, the CO2 Institute that is getting a lot of money to sort of basically sell lies to the public. So that's my anger, uh, which we I start. And, uh, but this is a lecture on physics and I've been talking for 10 minutes already. And so I should calm down and um, talk about what I believe to be true in the area that I've been looking at over the past few decades. And that's uh, yeah, quantum physics, you know, the, the essence of um, what electrons and protons are and photons and, you know, how they interact with each other and, and that kind of stuff. Just to, um, to go back, this blank slide, let me call it up. It is not the first time, and this is something that I, you know, I see when I get criticized for, wow, you, you are really, how do you dare to sort of doubt that a Nobel Prize was awarded to, you know, something that uh, can only be explained in, in terms of the Heisenberg board interpretation of quantum mechanics. And you, you know, you are a nobody and saying that basically, well, you know, have you looked at sort of the original interpretation of um, the Breis uh, matter wave? And this is what I'm going to talk. This is uh, what the, um, I don't, I don't remember his name, but this was the chairman of the Nobel Prize Committee in 1933 speaking uh, before um, Dirac spoke. So he was awarding the Nobel Prize to Heisenberg, um, to Schrödinger and to Dirac, the three of them. Um, I think that to be correct, I think Dirac and Schrödinger got the Nobel Prize in 1932, but because of political problems or whatever, I don't know, the ceremony was postponed to 1933 and Heisenberg properly got the Nobel Prize in 1933. But in any case, in 1933, you had this big thing, you know, Heisenberg, Schrödinger and Dirac, people who didn't necessarily get along with each other, I can talk about that. Uh, um, Schrödinger sort of um, wasn't even present there because he didn't agree with the way his uh, his equation was uh, was being interpreted there, and and rightly so. I actually think Schrödinger uh, was more with Einstein than, than than with Bohr. But in any case, it doesn't matter. This is what the chairman said for the the reason why they were awarded uh, uh, the Nobel Prize was they discovered this. Matter is formed or represented by a great number of this kind of waves. What kind of waves were well, the Breuse matter wave? You know, there's like a periodic phenomenon. That's what he called it. Um, the original PhD thesis of the Bray, I read it. He didn't talk about a linear wave, you know, and that, that's where I'm gonna come back. You know, if you interpret it as an orbital wave, it's fine. But in any case, the Breuse matter wave is real. Um, it is real, uh, it's just not a linear wave, I think. But if, if, if that, that's what he did with it. If you see it as a sort of a linear wave, like a photon or something, then, you know, um, you need to add them and certainty comes up and whatever. So you, you, you build a wave packet. So matter is formed by this wave packet, huh? a great number of these uh, the waves huh? with, a, with a frequency. Their velocities of propagation are all slightly different uh, because they have slightly different um, phases and frequencies, but they are such that they make a wave packet. They combine at some kind of point you know, we have this wave packet uh, if you you need to know a little bit about quantum mechanics probably you do you've read about it but you so you've got this wave packet and you also know that the big problem of a wave packet is that um well it is a crest uh, and it propagates itself in space um with a different velocity of the component wave uh, the group velocity and the phase velocity right so this wave crest then represents the material point which is formed by it or connected with it. So this typical vagueness of uh, the Bohr-Heisenberg, yeah, well, what is the wave function? Is it uh, the particle? Is it just a representation of it? Uh, what the hell is it? Huh? It's called a wave packet. Fine. As a result of this theory, one is forced to the conclusion that we should conceive of matter as not being durable or that it can have some definite extension in space. No, because we know what happens with the wave packet. It, it dissipates, it dissipates away. And for me, the, the reason is clear, you know, uncertainties are uncertainty about what it is, about 
the matter wave really which is quite precise which is an orbital wave i mean it's charged spinning around um if you sort of model that in, in some kind of vega and you insert these uncertainty about you know its frequency and whatever yeah you're gonna have a wave packet and then uh, um a dispersion relationship as called that's going to make it uh, dissipate away and so the waves which form the matter they travel in fact with different velocity and must therefore sooner or later separate that's the dissipation so matter changes form and extend in space now that's um uh, i should not use this uh i should not swear here but that's b uh, star star s star 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 uh, you know what i mean matter an electron and a proton it does not change form and extend in space photons don't either they're point like you know they don't dissipate away they're always either here or there or somewhere in between but they're not sort of smeared out and they surely don't dissipate away so the picture which we have of uh, the world you know which has been created uh, by by newton uh, by einstein um, by by all the classics uh, by by maxwell um, uh, by by Planck himself, um, by um, Boltzmann, whomever, you know, we must change this picture. We, the, the picture which has been created or matter being composed of unchangeable particles must be modified. This is so much nonsense. And the thing I dare to say that, that it's so much nonsense is because Dirac, in reply, uh, at uh, this, this uh, Nobel Prize event of 1933, his own speech, was uh well i should explain this you know when you when you think of an electron as a ring current you know parsons model schrodinger's model uh, the titterbewing model you know then you see that an electron has a structure it stays together and uh, you know i talked about this but this is sort of the picture you get a ring current and um, and you get a point like charge within the electron or the proton which uh, is just a point like charge it has no other attributes it has no rest mass uh, it has no angular momentum. Well, maybe it has, but you know, it doesn't matter. The uh, mo or magnetic moment. No, the magnetic moment of an electron, and um, you know, the angular momentum of the electron as a whole is explained by this point-like charge rotating around. Now, because it has zero rest mass, it must spin around at the speed of light, and that's where it acquires an effective mass which the equipartition theorem tells us that you know it generates this ring current electromagnetic field half of the energy is in the electromagnetic field and that electromagnetic field in turn keeps that ring current in place so half of the mass must be kinetic so it's linked to that effect is the effective mass of that point like charge spinning around in the electron and the other half is the electrodynamic field that sort of you know creates this literally perpetuum mobile the essence of nature and that's for an electron the only that is that's the case and for a proton you know there's just a three-dimensional oscillation we have a ring current and we have a, 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 a third plane of oscillation because the ring current you can see you know it oscillates up and down sideways so it makes it go round and round and round any case i've explained that um at nauseam as they say in latin in previous lectures so i won't come back so the dirac actually and Schrodinger was not there he um he uh you know, Dirac Schrodinger didn't get very well along I think in terms of what what was what and yeah, Dirac's wave equation and Schrodinger's and Dirac said well Schrodinger's is uh, relativistically not correct which I dispute uh, I'm not going to go into that I think Schrodinger was right and Dirac acknowledges that you know he says the variables in these equations they they um you know there's this uh, um uh, solution to the wave equation uh, a trivial solution uh, the elementary wave function and uh, that that sort of is there that has been worked out by Schrodinger who says like you know an electron and here Dirac confuses the electron as a whole because they were thinking of it as some kind of point like thing but I don't I, th I think an electron has structure I said the point like thing in, is inside that's the charge which is oscillating around and the energy you know or the the, the, the mass of that whole electron is is you know a measure of the inertia of that energy packet so um the Bray also talks about it in his phd study he basically looks at matter particles as energy packets he literally calls them that way and then he associates you know um, a frequency with them and and so on and so on and that gives then rise to what wheeler called the mass without mass model you know a charge oscillating a force has to act on something acts on a charge mass is just a measure of the inertia to a change in the state of motion 
of that energy packet. So Dirac recognized that. He said that, you know, there must be a very high frequency oscillatory motion. Um, so that's that orbital zitter bewegung thing uh, of very small amplitude. Well, the, the amplitude uh, is basically the radius of the electron as a whole. And that's superposed on the regular motion of that electron as a whole, which appears to us. And as a result of this oscillatory motion, the velocity of the electron at any time he calls it the electron but it's that point like charge and it should go back to that figure you know if we have that ring current and we insert some lateral velocity you know the radius of the oscillation must become smaller because part of the light speed you know becomes uh, you know a, a lateral um, velocity uh, so part of the orbital velocity becomes that lateral velocity so uh, but it's um the velocity as a whole of that point like charge equals the velocity of light he said this cannot be verified directly by experiment frequency of the oscillatory motion is very high yeah we know that we can't measure it the matter wave frequency is is enormous um and its amplitude is indeed very small one but one does believe in this consequence of the theory since other consequences of the theories are inseparably bound up with this one such as the law of cat scattering of light yeah indeed compton scattering you know elastic or inelastic you know it fits perfectly well with this picture where you have you know this very complicated a trajectory of a point like charge uh, because an electron you know we make look at it in its, its rest frame or uh, in the inertial frame or in our in the moving frame of reference from our frame of reference these are confirmed by experiment yeah scattering is a uh, is damn well confirmed so i'm just saying this that um you know for me this is the same thing it's not because the the nobel uh, prize um, uh, uh, committees they uh, I, I sometimes think they, they they give prices to you know physicists who've come up with something that's very fancy probably true uh, and this and that but they they don't always have it right and their interpretations of what you know Dirac came up with or Schrodinger came up with um, you know uh, pff, what's the value they do they do got it wrong they got it wrong according to me in 1933 and they surely got it wrong last year where you have basically some lunatic a climate change denier um you no know, they must have known that he sort of lets himself lobby uh, I'm, I'm thinking also a little bit about you know Gerhard Hoft he's another um, Nobel Prize winner he associated himself with his Mars ones of one venture uh, I come from Holland you know we're gonna have like uh, Elon Musk uh, SpaceX program because you know NASA and the Chinese they'll never get to Mars on time and they're uh, planning unmanned missions so we'll do a manned mission uh, we'll bring people to Mars and they started recruiting and I was going like you know what's the science behind this we're in no way ready um, uh, and what do you want to do on Mars with humans? I mean, send robots. You want to mine rare earth minerals? There's no evidence they're sort of open rare earth uh, mines and on Mars. How would you ship them back? Uh, this, I mean, there's so much stuff. Is it sort of a, the next station to the next exoplanet? Well, forget about that. The next exoplanet where there might be, you know, intelligence or human life or whatever you want to call it or another civilization, it's 4.4 million light years away even if you would have a spaceship that sort of has a matter antimatter engine or whatever that could accelerate you know spaceship up to speeds that are like 0 0.1 or 0 0.2 times light speed you know you would need 44 years to get there and the thing is you know a light a spaceship that travels at that speed you know it hits a speck of matter some molecules some dust some space dust you know, and it will disintegrate the kinetic energy of that collision between even a massive sparse spaceship and a speck of dust you know is, is just bomb finish end of story and so here are he went along with that and that generated like i don't know 10 15 uh, million or or more uh the same thing like in you know called fusion uh you create that hype and these are very serious scientists huh? but they they must know that they're promoting something that you know doesn't make sense from a scientific point of view and i see that happening all the time and that's where i get angry where i say like well you know your stuff hasn't been peer-reviewed so what what's wrong with my stuff so let's go to my stuff now um yeah i represent some things here you know um uh, look at my previous videos the one thing you know this 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 guru like stuff you know we have these potential wells and quantum tumbling and you know whatever it, it's kind of it's kind of easy uh, you know they these people take very static uh, views and for them you know a potential wall uh, or 
a well with walls around it and you can imagine it you know is that like yeah these are real walls you know and then you have something zittering around in it you know some more some energy and from time to time what a miracle you know this thing tunnels through well you know think of shooting bullets like in the first world war uh through um you know when things weren't synchronized uh, that you had a machine gun the first planes often shot their own propeller uh, to pieces and had to land because there was too much damage to the propeller when when the the the, the shoot the, the 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 gun isn't synchronized with you know, the movement of your propeller you know from time to time bullet is going to hit the blade uh, and others it's going to pass through but it's sort of like um, it's a dynamic thing you might say here you know imagine this this would be you know, this is like a metaphor for our electron, our point like charge. It zitters around at enormous speed, light speed actually, but it's always somewhere. And, uh, you know, if you shoot a lot of it, if you shoot photons at an electron, from time to time, you will hit the blade, the propeller blade, in this case, the point like charge, and you will have um, elastic scattering. You know, your photon will just bounce back. And in other cases, you know, it will start messing with the electromagnetic field of that electron and uh, you know it will get absorbed it will create a disequilibrium situation the angular momentum will not be exactly equal to you know what Planck Einstein's relation said it should be equal to you know a multiple number of uh, uh, h bar times the, the frequency and, and so you have like a mixed up uh, disequilibrium state with a photon and an electron being entangled indeed at some point in time you know it's like throwing a spanner in, in the wheels of something you know the spanner will fly out again and hopefully the wheel will not be damaged and you know it will turn back to its um, equilibrium state so that that's sort of all the magic there is to you know quantum tunneling and and stuff um antimatter you know time going back time does not go back let me tell you that Kant was right we should relativistically correct it but in a way you know time and three-dimensional space they are inherent they're categories of the mind they're inherent to our way of thinking about motion uh, on the left hand side you see that that's an impossible um, um, an impossible thing we've got time uh, you know going in one direction and then uh, you know this particle has a trajectory which um, which makes that uh, you know at one point in time it can be like at three points in space at the same time because this curve uh, is is uh, is allowed to go um, to go back in time so um, that's not going to happen. Time goes in one direction only, and you don't need difficult uh, quantum mechanical theories to explain that. It's just part. Look, look at the green curve there. That's pretty wild. That's a wild oscillation. You know, the, the time, uh, the thing accelerates, reaches a certain position, and reverses. You know, back gear, uh, it goes back to where it was. Uh, it stops again. It goes a little bit back in direction where it was going, and then it goes more back again, etc. It is possible in theory this motion because this particle is, you know, only at one point in space at one point in time. And no matter how weird this oscillation is or this curve is, you know, it's 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 a regular function, and time is a regular, or, or let's say position is a regular function of time. And it should be because otherwise none, nothing makes sense anymore in physics. Um, this is on the oscillator model. People say, that, well, you know, your model um, is this some kind of uh, ether theory, you know, elasticity of space time. No, it's not. That oscillator model that I have when you say, you know, an electron goes up and down, it goes left and right. You know, in the end, it will be a nice circular orbital. Uh, that's that's here, you know, a sine and a cosine and whatever. This is a mathematical representation of what goes on. But let me be very clear: this is like um, these, these these oscillator force, I would say, is 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 just a mathematical representation. There is no such thing as an elasticity of space time. The 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 ring current is kept in place by you know ring current generates an electromagnetic field, uh, magnetic field basically. That field is quantized. We know that everything is quantized in nature. It obeys the Planck-Einstein relation. The energy in that field equals h bar times the frequency of, of the oscillation in that field, the electromagnetic field factors that are, again, you know, that's the airplane there. You should think of these things as dynamic. They're not static. Um, except where you have a proton and the, the atomic model and, and whatever, you know, we can have electrostatic fields, of course, but, you know, in 99.9, .9, percent of the situations you're going to look at you're going to be looking at a dynamic electromagnetic field uh, magnetic fields are dynamic 
So um, there's no hocus pocus there. Uh, the oscillator model, oops. Um, let me go to the next one here. You know, and we can break it down. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be two oscillations that explain a ring current. You know, we can have three uh, as long as they're symmetric. We have four. Uh, it's like, a, you know, think of a motorbike engine or whatever. Here, here it's nice. We have a, a star engine of a, of a plane. I like this illustration because it shows that, uh, you know, you have this thing indeed. The whole thing has angular momentum, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a helicopter with a, a rotary wing on it, you know, you, you you need something to stabilize the mass underneath. Um, the Russians found something with, you know, two two blades, uh, two propellers to keep the helicopter steady and all these kind of things. In any case, the, the mechanics of this are very beautiful. And uh, and I said the difference, and that's where the metaphor stops. Is um, we can imagine this 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 metaphor holds for an electron, for a ring current, for a proton. We have an oscillation in one direction, an oscillation in the other one. And then on top of that, an oscillation in, in the third uh, a possible degree of freedom. And that's where the electron and proton structure, according to me, they are they are very different and makes it more difficult for uh, to model a proton. But I think I've sort of done that. Uh, I will come back to that. So let's move on. Half an hour. Um, these are the equations. I won't won't go into them. These are related to that oscillator model, and they they respect. Uh, the, the relativistically correct uh, uh, um, law of, of Newton, uh, uh, we, 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 we can imagine uh, it just becomes mathematically a bit difficult. What do you have if M0 is 0? Um, but that's sort of where I put the other equation there uh, with the differential equation uh, with, with a first order derivative. I would say it's not differential. Why is the differential equation? The um, the energy uh, in an oscillator will be constant, eh? the, and so the the energy, the 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 derivative of energy um, with regard to time, d e over d t, will be zero. The energy doesn't change, and and you can break it up in a kinetic and and a potential energy part. The, the one over two k x square is the potential energy part, and the other one is the kinetic energy part, and. Um, now, any oscillator model will, will tell you that on average, you know, kinetic and potential energy are are, are the same. And then we have these this symmetries. We, we can sort of model the equations of motion, and that, that explains, um, uh, which I said in the, in the previous lecture, I think you should go there, is, you know, mc square, uh, the energy is equal to mc square. Well, if you think of c, velocity, we have an explanation there, one of the explanations of, of how um, uh, Einstein's uh, mass energy equivalence relationship makes sense. We can write it as a, as a vector cross product of, of a radius vector, of an orbital frequency vector. Something spins around, so it has an orbital frequency, there's a radius vector, and then we have these constraints, I would say, on the equations of motion that um, you know, the absolute value of the radius uh, will be you know, the, the square root of the squares of its components in the x and the y and the z direction, and the same for the orbital um, uh, frequency vector. So I won't go into that because originally I had actually planned to make um, a presentation without any equations at all. Yeah, I want to go to the mach uh, interference experiment. But before I do that, um, you know, in a number of my lectures, I I, uh, I really studied Feynman's lecture in very much detail, and in several of my my own lecture, my own papers, I sort of say like, well, this is a, a sloppy argument, or this is plain incorrect. There's one on 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 uh, the 720 degree symmetries you get with spin one and a half particles, which which is uh, which is not which is not correct because he. Um, he looks at a you know common phase factor uh, where he treats um, the imaginary unit you know the exponent of the wave function, the imaginary unit times the energy divided by t. He says uh, pi uh, 180 degrees uh, that's a common phase factor plus pi or minus pi as a phase. We can scrap that. I'm going like no it matters if you go from you know plus one in uh, the positive uh, counterclockwise direction. You know, uh, pi, or you go in the counterclockwise direction, minus pi, depending on your convention for the imaginary unit. The imaginary unit is a rotation operator. It matters how you get there. And one, you know, you're confusing particles. You know, you look at these things as like they're spin zero particles, but they are not the plus or minus sign in front of the wave function. And in the exponent, the imaginary exponent of the wave function is not uh, just, you know, it's convention. And most of us will use this convention and uh, no. 
it's your spin direction. Any case, um, I talked about this uh, too much already, and I'm saying it now with a lot more conviction, but with sort of less um, uh, less things to show. I don't care too much. Maybe um, you're not listening in anymore, but uh, that's all right. Um, I said I'm not here to sell things. But um, let, let's go back to that Mach Zender to interference. And um, so I want to start actually basically before I talk about you know, Mach Zender, a photon that inter one photon that interferes with itself somehow. Uh, I want to go like, uh, you know, uh, basically a photon, in, uh, you know, hitting an electron. We should think of an electron in real life. Huh? Uh, this is a photon incoming light and it hits some material. Uh, uh, I, I like to talk about this because we will be talking about a nanometer slit, uh, real material, and electrons or photons going through it. So imagine that, you know, we have an electron. You should realize that it's not a free electron. It might be a free electron. Okay, but many of these experiments, you know, scattering experiments, they send light, uh, high energy or low energy photons, gamma rays or, uh, you know, uh, normal, normal visible light or microwave radiation. They will send it to some material um, called fusion electron often palladium or, or some any case whatever material and so you have an electron that is in atomic orbital and we know from shooting as a that's pretty complicated motion that an electron has there and i said i make it even more complicated and not because you know i think that the electron itself having some structure and there's a point like charge sitting around in it and um, but in any case let's let's suppose we have uh, that that black uh, little ball there uh, the so, that, so that's an electric charge and then we know a photon, uh, it is point-like, eh? it's, it's, it's an oscillating electric uh, field vector. Uh, I'm talking, showing a linearly polarized uh, photon here. Uh, the electric field vector, well, big and small and whatever, and we have the magnetic field vector. I said these are, it's one force, yeah? it's the electromagnetic, I shouldn't say force field. You know, the difference between a field and a force is, and this shows it nicely actually, we have an incoming field, uh, so that's like a, a force without a charge to act on and then you know the field grabs onto a charge and field becomes a force it has a charge to act upon so the electric field factor will um, cause the electric charge to go uh, well in the direction of the uh, electric field vector so it, it's going to get some velocity v or at least some kind of thrust in that direction um, I said for me it's kind of clear that uh, the velocity of the point like charge inside of an electron and that's what that's the real thing on which this field factor is going to act you know whatever motion that point like charge was in now we add a, a lateral component to it and it's in the direction of the electric field but so that little v there that you see that's only the lateral component of a much more complicated motion of that electron I'll come back to that, and uh, and so we're only considering one aspect of, of a very complicated reality here. But in any case, let's do that. We have a very small velocity, or large velocity, I don't know what, but in any case, something that is non-relativistic, a very small fraction of, uh, of, of the light speed, in a certain direction, to be precise, in the direction of the electric field factor. Now, we have, of course, you know, the, we, we know the magnetic field oscillates with the electric field, I'll show how exactly. And so then we know that besides that electric force, the electrostatic force on that charge, we will also have a magnetic force, which is the vector cross product of the velocity vector, the magnetic field vector, and the charge Q, which is the elementary charge in this case, you know, um, an electron, so it's minus one. So uh, quickly check, you know, we have this right hand rule for it uh, and it works all right, because you, you do need to check on this thing because you might also think like, Okay, this is, um, and here I'm going here, let's see, ah, yeah, no, that is an equation that's get out of there. Let's first look at that right-hand rule. It, it works, huh? We have a, a moving charge in one direction, huh? So the right-hand rule, I'm going like, yeah, okay, that's a bit complicated, and the, the middle finger sticks out. It's not like this. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, it, it's like this. Uh, so yeah, charge, charge go. Okay, charge goes up. Um, magnetic field is there, and yes, the. Um, oh yeah, that's the funny thing with the camera, right? I'm, I'm pointing the other direction. It should be like this. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I have a magnetic force that is in the direction of the direction of propagation of that photon. 
Um, you can do then calculations, and this is sort of where things get fuzzy with Feynman. He sort of says, okay, there's a pushing momentum. The uh, what is the the light has some pushing momentum. So um, that pushing momentum is is linear. So it's sort of a linear momentum. Uh, we know the linear momentum p must be equal to some kind of mass, a mass factor, the mass of the photon. What mass? Uh, photons don't have any mass. No, they don't have any rest mass. But they acquire relativistic mass. They have energy in the end. So mass energy equivalence relation. They have a relativistic mass. And that's what I write there. Times the velocity of that, uh, of what? Well, the photon here in this case. I give the equation because Feynman says he looks at the electron. And he does it very simple. I'm, I'm looking at the photon here. So it has a linear momentum m times c. Uh, M I can write, I said, as the relativistic mass, the energy of the photon divided by C squared times that velocity C. So I arrive at a very tiny, uh, apparently uh, very tiny, yeah, because I have the energy of a photon, which is already uh, not very much as compared to the energy of a proton of an electron. Okay, when we talk uh, gamma rays, uh, it becomes different. They, uh, they become a bit nearer to these uh, energies of protons and electrons, but here it's uh, usually a normal incoming light, visible light, let's think. So it's gonna be very tiny. Now that, that's a big error that um, is made often when when um, when speeds uh, get relativistic, and this is where I said it, it's, this V for me is like some kind of lateral velocity. Think of that ring current spinning at enormous, enormous speed, light speed. And then we inject sort of, well, the electron as a whole, this ring current as a whole is gonna move in some direction. Well, then some of the orbital velocity will, it's, will still be an orbit. It becomes a spiral-like structure. And it's also where, you know, the, uh, the, the orbital frequency vector, you know, and, it's not going to be exactly in this in the line of propagation of that electron as a whole but it's gonna you know slightly wiggle like sort of precession but it's not precession any case the when when you think of charge this point like charge inside of an electron at light speed then you know um well the velocity factor is so high that the magnetic force and the electric force you know their magnitudes become the same so you should watch out with that idea that the magnetic force, you know, it doesn't really matter. Uh, it, it's one over C times the magnitude of the electric field vector. Well, no, at, a, at, a, at the smallest of scales, velocities are so high, light speed actually, that it's the uh, it's basically the, I would say, almost the, the magnetic field that's calling the shots. Um, so yeah, I put that uh, illustration there up again. Said when you do have light speed, and I'll illustrate here. You know the magnetic force uh, yeah, might look tiny. The charge times the magnitude of uh, of that velocity vector times the magnetic field. But if that velocity vector, you know, um, becomes uh, close to the the speed of light, that's what I write here. You know, Q times V and B. We might it indeed write the, the the magnitude of the magnetic field vector as the magnitude of the electric field vector divided by C. So we have this V over C factor, which is the relative velocity. If that beta, uh, um, V over C goes to one, then uh, the magnitude of the magnetic force is exactly the same as, uh, as that of the electric force on a point like charge. So, so be careful about these things. I'm, I'm saying it because in a lot of the analysis and standard textbooks, uh, they sort of forget about the magnetic field vector. And I'm going like, you, you're missing maybe not the most important part of the picture, but uh, you know, pretty much at least as important as the as what I'm showing here. You know, the, the electromagnetic wave, a photon, this is a linearized wave. Um, so think of the photon being, it's maybe hard, you see that, that little green thing there? Think of that little green uh, thing where you see sort of that oscillating E and B. Uh, um, e goes from zero to plus one and then it goes back to minus one. And in the meanwhile, the B vector is only a fraction, one over C of the magnitude of the electric field vector. But again, that doesn't matter that it's a fraction. Uh, if, if, the, if the charge on which this field is going to act upon is, uh, if it has a velocity that is uh, you know, a significant, significant fraction of light speed or light speed itself, then uh, the magnitudes become the same. But that's what you have. Um, I'm pointing this out because it's gonna pop up in my uh, explanation of the Mach Zinder. What we have here is, um, is like a spin zero uh, photon. And you know, somewhere in Feynman you read, uh, well, spin zero photons don't exist. Well, linearly polarized waves exist. And, um, and, and linearly polarized uh, light waves 
uh, exist of photons. And so these photons, you know, that make up uh, the wave, uh, you know, a lot of photons make up a big wave and the, the intensity of the electromagnetic field factor and whatever adds up, you know, more photons, same energy is higher, higher energy density. Um, you know, their, their spin will be zero. And uh, it's only when you have um, what you have here. Here I only put one vector. Think of this being the electric field vector of, of a photon. It's actually, it comes from Wikipedia, and both of these, um, these uh, uh, illustrations, these GIF files. Um, when that goes round and round, you should now imagine the magnetic field vector. It's not represented on that uh, uh, GIF on, on the right-hand side. Is um, you know, that's the thing in the most analysis, they only think about the electric field. Well, no, the magnetic field is there also. But you can clearly see here you have a spin one photon. And uh, well, depending on your convention from from which side, if you look at the back or the front, what you're going to call left handed or right handed uh, spin, uh, because it could go in the other direction. Uh, so uh, let's say here we have when we look in the direction of motion, we would have um, uh, left-handed, left-handed circularized, polarized wave or photon. You know, make abstraction of this wave-like thing. Just think about an electric and a magnetic field in one point moving with these oscillating things attached to it, field vectors. Um, I'm gonna take a, a little pause um, before I go then to my uh, Mach Zender, which I think is the next one. Ah, no, there's still one left here. Just to say, like, you know, if you really think of an electron having some kind of structure, or, you know, even if you don't wanna do that, you think of an electron, you know, being indeed point like. Uh, you know, a very classical picture uh, that Feynman has in his lectures, right? An electron is an electron, and we think of it as being point-like and having some non-zero rest mass, whatever. It's going to be an atomic orbital, and that atomic orbital that you can see, at least from the classical Schrödinger model of a height, you know, it's a very complicated thing. It's like this spiral structure around, and it's got all kinds of subshells that are possible and whatever, and all these are going to pack one unit of angular momentum and whatever, but, you know, we can have elliptical orbitals, we can have all kinds of shapes, for uh, you know the trajectory of an electron in in something real in in an atom or mostly a molecule you know, an h2 molecule or water or whatever palladium or whatever so it's gonna have you know complicated motion when that photon hits it and this is what i show here so the 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 simplified um, uh, sample where you have an electric field vector an incoming electric field vector that e it's not the energy you know, we need to build um, some kind of a model for interaction, which is not going to be easy, where we say, okay, the, the tangential component of the electric field vector, that's the one that's going to be, you know, acting upon uh, the charge, Q. And so that's going to give, uh, in this case here, you know, this electric force, this, uh, this, this little V uh, show, this, this force that makes um, the, the electron move in, a, in the direction of the electric field vector, you can see here, well, it's, it's not going to be entirely in the direction of the electric field vector. No, it's going to be in direction of the tangential component of that electric field vector. So I'm just saying these very simple models that you get uh, in Feynman's lectures or, or standard textbooks to say like, well, oh, that this is how we calculate, you know, how linear or angular momentum gets transferred from, you know, a photon to, to an electron. Well, you know, you should always think like, okay, it's not that simple. Uh, it's a very complicated structure and in the end, and this is what I want to get at, create some kind of disequilibrium situation, you know, the electron and photons, electromagnetic field being in some kind of thing that, and then in the end, the electron is going to become an electron again with some kinetic energy in a certain direction added or not added and, uh, and a photon that's being emitted and the difference between the incoming photon and the outgoing photon, these are two different photons. I think also with, you know, um, uh, inelastic scattering. Um, you know, the, 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 the frequencies are different. Uh, there's been a very, very short time, maybe just one cycle time of the electron, where, you know, the, the equilibrium situation is restored and the outgoing photon is a different photon. It goes in a different direction, has usually a different frequency or a different phase. Uh, you know, it's a different photon. And this is something, you know, when you, you try to, you know, when you think about these things that the phase can differ, um, the um, the magnitude uh, or the energy of the photon can differ. Um, you know that this this interaction is much more complex than the simplified 
uh, assumption that we are using to you know quantum mechanically explain these ampl amplitudes that then give you know uh, the, these weird results for a photon interfering with itself um, that's where you think like okay fine uh, if if I have something that you know is a bit more realistic in terms of you know assumptions and what things actually are photons electrons um, you know maybe I can have a classical explanation for, for some phenomena that you know at first give give very weird experimental results so um i'm gonna go to the uh, to this slide okay this is um yeah i'm gonna take a little break i've been talking for 50 minutes and then i will come back to this um don't worry if you're still here um stay here uh, because this one photon max ender is like the, the question i get like you know how, how would it be explained and i'm gonna do that in in a few seconds um, by you know seeing here left-handed right-handed and um, and telling you something about these uh, my, my theory about basically circularly polarized waves are split by beam splitter into linearly polarized waves and you know at the level of a photon which makes up these waves uh, I think the same can happen and this is what I'm going to explain like in, in, in two minutes when I'm back from my break and my cigarette Okay, I'm back. Uh, where were we? Here we have, um, yeah, the Mach-Zender experiment. One photon, an inter photon interfering with itself. So um, we we should um, remind ourselves that you know a photon is not just a photon. We have uh, different kinds of photon. Usually, the photons that are used in these um, experiments, they will have gone through. Uh, you know, Polaroid filter, and they will be polarized uh, circularly. They will have a nice polarization. And so if they are circularly polarized, uh, they will be left-handed or they will be right-handed. Now, if we look at, um, uh, so we have a left-handed and a right-handed, or I said depending on direction, look and your convention, the the one is right-handed and the other one is left-handed. But look at sort of how it looks in terms of. Um, um, you know the electric and magnetic field vectors uh, so we have the red line that red spiral uh, line that um, that kind of shows um, you should really try to visualize this in your head it took me a long time before I was able to do so but now I'm, I'm better at it is uh, the electric field vector uh, you know it, it's uh, the top of the arrow huh? we should really realize that the, the photon itself is just a point huh? uh, it, it's uh, and uh, the value uh, of the electric and the magnetic field vector is zero everywhere except at the point where this photon happens to be and then the electric field vector will be you know have a maximum large or small amplitude and go in this or that direction and um, and the magnetic field vector you know is there too and uh, and there you can see that um, you know we can we can decompose. Uh, this is what we're doing here. This um, circularly polarized photon basically as a superposition of two linearly polarized photon. And this is where I'm going. Like the one photon mass ender experiment. You know I do think that you know if, if, if circularly polarized wave can be split into um, uh, uh, two beams that have uh, that are both linearly polarized you know one in the horizontal plane one in the vertical plane or you know depending on the orientation uh, what it is then that should somehow explain also why a photon in these experiments uh, indeed sort of splits up in two entities that both have a certain linear polarization and then you really need to look very carefully at these uh, you know what are the phases of these things um, and you know when they come back at a certain point depending on on um, um, the, their face uh, the, the thing is, uh, as you will see in my explanation, the phase is always so nice um, when, when you split beams, you have that. It's sort of 90 degrees or 180 degrees out of phase, the, the two things that come out of it. And that's actually what, what explains why you have either um, uh, positive interference, uh, constructive interference, or negative interference. Uh, the, the other thing you need to realize with these experiments is always like they gloss over the energy equations. I don't, and this is one of the reasons why I arrived at this classical explanation i would say is uh, i'm always going like uh, you know the energy can't disappear um two photons can indeed sort of uh, destructively interfere but the energy has to go somewhere 
and it goes into it indeed into the material you know it gets absorbed and there's some kinetic energy of electrons so when a photon gets absorbed in a material you know the energy doesn't disappear it goes into the material it's heat you know, kinetic energy of electrons or whatever if they uh, interfere constructively you know we get a new circularly polarized wave but uh, you know the energy has to be twice the energy of one of these linearly polarized waves um, uh, as, a separate, as a separate entity so we, we do add energies um, I'm not going to go too much in the equations here but just go um, you know this is the setup um, and I will refer I will not go into the detail because otherwise I will be and I still have to do you know a number of other things that I've promised to do uh, indeed like electron interference you know the one or two split uh, experiment of Feynman, Feynman that finally in 2012 I'll come back to that and show sort of the, these nice things where they actually set it up just the way Feynman wanted it or described it uh, nanometer scale um, uh, apparatus where you send photons through one or two slits um, you vary the width of the slits so I still need to do that too and it will take me 20 minutes so here I will take not more than 10-15 minutes to explain it but this is the um, uh, setup of the experiment um, so what you have is um, is uh, yeah, an interferometer this is called a max zender interfere we have two uh, uh, beam splitters the red ones and uh, we have an incident beam of said photons uh, we should think about what photons linearly polarized no they will be circularly polarized um, and then um, yeah we have uh, it goes into a beam splitter so if it will be beam if you don't think in photons you know the beam will split a part of it will be uh, reflected and goes to mirror a uh, mirror one huh, where we have perfect reflection no observation of the photon huh, just a reflection and that depends on the, the material huh? this is a mirror uh, think of a mirror how complicated it is actually where you really design a material that you know its crystal structure is so perfect that you know it reflects all of the photons um, uh, so we yeah, mirrors are special mirrors are weird so um the beam splits the beam and part of the beam goes to mirror one uh, i said i'm going to talk about photons but it's exactly the same thing uh, because a photon has has a wave function and so it's like a wave you can analyze it just the same thing as a water wave um and part of the beam goes to mirror two and then they recombine and they arrive while well, they don't recombine well they do actually they come at the beam splitter two uh, beam splitter 2 recombines and that sends then um, in theory um, you know there are a number of possibilities uh, it, it will send two outgoing beams uh, to the photon detectors uh, which are there photon detector 1 and at the bottom photon detector 0 it's hidden by me but so the bottom one is 0 and the upper one is the photon detector 1 and now there is a strange thing is of course that um, you know this thing can be set up an experiment and you know, strangely enough, all the light goes into uh, the photon detector zero, goes to the bottom. And then we, you know, we change the setup a little bit, the distances, we move some stuff around. Um, the angles usually are the same. Um, but um, then suddenly everything goes into detector one. How can you explain that classically? Well, the classical explanation for a beam, uh, if it would be radiation, would be, well, it splits into two beams. So those two beams, um, they either they arrive in phase at beam splitter two, or they arrive out of phase. And I said it's a complicated structure with the electric and magnetic field vector. You know, you need to, to keep track of these things. It's going to be like 90 or 180 degrees difference. So um, you will have indeed on the phase. That's pretty classical. Um, you know, either constructive interference at beam splitter two. Or destructive interference and here we will indeed have you know the, the beams will recombine and go through that's what the equivalent is or they will you know uh, be reflected and all go into photon detector zero and it's not any different if you think of this being one circularly polarized photon splitting up into like half photons literally and the fact that they are there you will say this is nonsense i've never seen something well you know there is weak measurement um you see the, these experiments have been and the the the, the beauty and the smartness of these uh, you know clever quantum physicists is that they explain weak measurement 
Again, in terms of some metaphysical or metamatical explanation, as you know, oh, it confirms our theory. I'm going like, no, it confirms that you know there's really something there. If you have weak measurement, it means you know both at mirror one and mirror two, you're detecting something, and so it means that the thing that came in, that one photon, has effectively split up in two separate parts, which you can weakly measure um, as they go uh, pass by mirror one, get reflected, and mirror two. So these uh, theory weak measurement of, uh, you know, it shows to me that, you know, yeah, two half photons, it makes sense. So what you have classically is that your incoming photon will be circularly polarized, left or right-handed. The first beam splitter will split your photon in two linearly polarized photon waves, what I would say, of photons. The mirrors will be reflected. And then, uh, you know, you recombine these waves. Uh, not only taking it, I mean, electrically, you look at it, and then you will have positive or negative interference, and that will explain the binary outcome of that um, of that experiment. So uh, there's all kinds of complications in this thing um, because uh, reflection um, reflection is already I mean, it's a bit complicated. You know, actually, I told you that you know, even if it gets um, reflected perfectly well, you know, the, something will happen. There will be an absorption. It will be emitted in a different direction. The photon that gets reflected is, is in a sense, uh, different. It has a different direction. It has the same energy, but that's the thing also where, you know, in all these explanations, even the weirdest one, you'll see, well, oh, there's a phase shift when a photon gets reflected from mirror one. Phase shift, to be precise, of pi, 180 degrees. So, um, hello. What's the classical explanation there? Um, there must be one, and but they're silent. On that. That's just sort of you know some some fact of quantum mechanics that you have to expect. Well, no, I think like it sounds logical to me in a way. I don't have a detailed explanation, but I can readily see that you know we have an electron here, you know, and a photon coming in. It's mixing, and then you know it will get you know, really return to equilibrium situation by emitting a photon in a different direction with exactly the same energy uh, um, by, you know, something that should be a nice mathematical factor to take into account that the time that is needed to sort of re-emit that photon will be, ha will have something to do with the cycle time of the photon, of the electron or whatever. So I can see that, you know, there must be a nice phase shift, not 70 degrees, 60 degrees, uh, 210 degrees, but no, 90 degrees or 180 degrees. Fine. So these subtleties are not explained in, 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 uh, in the textbook. Um, I don't explain them either here. But um, yeah, the assumptions that are sort of uh, casually, you know, the linear waves need to be orthogonal to each other. Uh, that's crucial. Um, if they weren't, and I explained that in, in my, then uh, we would be in trouble with the energy conservation law. Um, I'm having here my notes in front of me, and I would dig into that energy conservation law. Uh, the construct of industrial interference for linear polarized beams, what happens then, and, uh, and, and indeed showing why um, phase shifts must be nice, 180 degrees, because otherwise you do get in problem when, when you recombine beams. They won't recombine. You will have two separate uh, photons, and they won't interfere constructively or destructively. You know, they will just stay separate. Uh, once you come start combining photons, which um, geometrically, you know, should be able to, to but they have a different phase, uh, they will be separate photons. Um, that's theory, um, and that's practice. Uh, and that's sort of what, what's so nice about quantum mechanics, that you get something unexpected, but when you think about it, you know, the geometry of these things are nice and implies, you know, that certain things have certain uh, need values, um, right angles, uh, 180 degrees uh, phase shifts and whatever. So um, I need like five, six pages to uh, to write this all out. And I would probably need like an hour to uh, to go into the detail. But this is sort of what I said here. Huh? Um, this would be the classical explanation. And in detail, you know, when you when you follow, this is what I do here. This is what um, I describe, you know, and I describe it for a right-hand, uh, right-hand uh, circular, circularly polarized photon and a left-hand one, RHC and LHC. What happens at um, uh, the beam splitter one? So it's splitting in two linear polarized beams, uh, and I represent that, and this is interesting, by um, 
you know the plane and this is where I indeed sort of these imaginary units I, the way function mat is great and is only unexploited I exploit it because uh, I is a rotation operator and, uh, and people then represent a wave function by using the same imaginary unit. I'm going like, no, here we have a wave whose plane of oscillation of the electric and ma magnetic field vector is, is in 90 degrees different. So that should be a different a rotation operator, a one that is uh, perpendicular uh, to uh, I as the imaginary. So that would be J in Hamilton's, uh, I, will, I will talk about quaternion math a little bit, it's, it's a beautiful system, uh, but we need a J. And, um, and that's what I do here. I, I sort of uh, analyze it in terms of wave functions and I deconstruct these wave functions in sine and cosine as, as we should to make sure that we know what is what, uh, what is the electric field vector, what is the magnetic field vector. And then I, um, you know, I re-arrive at the mirror um, and we see depending on what uh, um, uh, what direction the oscillation is in, uh, you know, the phase difference get there, gets that beam splitter too, and we have the final result that says, well, either it goes here, depending on the starting phase, or else it goes there. And uh, and that's what I do, so if these two tables are a bit similar, the only difference is that, you know, I take it for two ideal situations where, you know, I have a, a photon that um, you know, where the, the phase, I would say, of the electric field vector, it could be the magnetic one, is zero. And in the second table, it's like, well, okay, well, what happens if it's 180 degrees further? Um, and then it goes into, um, you know, the other detector. So I haven't prepared this super well, but I refer to, to this. This was a manuscript I had sent. It has uh, some things in it I would rewrite, but it has a fairly extensive, I said, uh, five-page um, explanation where I think I have an explanation for this. I won't say it's the explanation. Um, it has assumptions as well, which may make sense or not make sense to you. Um, in these five pages also, I, uh, I do show that sort of if we have like, you know, random, um, you know, the difference between the phases of, of the two beams is, is not zero or 180 degrees like it is between these two tables, but some random value in between. Then I said, then you have situations where you get in trouble with the, um, the energy conservation law. So um, I would say have a look at it and um, um, see it as an exercise. So the, um, I could prepare it, uh, read out the five pages to you. Uh, I would have to look into them. These are things I wrote like three, four years ago. I always thought I should revisit it. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I'm doing it now, but very cursory. Um, I think this mystery is solved. And if this is not the solution, well, it will be probably a very similar looking um, explanation. Uh, equally classical, equally, uh, you know, imagining, uh, you know, okay, this circular polarized beam, superposition of two linear waves. What are the phases of the electric magnetic field vectors? How does, uh, you know, constructive and destructive interference really work? Um, you know, what are the energy conservation equations? What are the um, possible outcomes of the physicality of this beam being split at the first splitter and being recombined at the second one? And um, and I believe this, um, was oh, Bell's no-go theorem, right? because of this and that and well, blah, 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 and this and that. So no, Bell's no go theorem. Uh, for me, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, if you have, and, and Bell at the end of his life, he also uh, uh, was a bit depressed. Uh, he did not get a Nobel Prize because he got a brain hemorrhage before um, he was nominated. And so Nobel Prizes are only awarded to people who are still alive. Um, so he died quite young, but at the end of his life, you know, the Celsius said, he said, I hope one day someone disproves my, my, uh, my theorem. Um, people ask me that, oh, can't you disprove Bell's no-go theorem? I said, uh, you know, the Breuer once said that, you know, a theory, um, the hypothesis of a theory is, uh, a, you know, it's like, it's like a hole. You, you, your theory um, uh, is good and your assumptions are good. If the consequences of that theory, uh, you know, correspond to, you know, something that makes sense, that is real, that is a, 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 not a mere calculation, but, a, you know, a theory, calculation, explanation.
packed in one, which should expect also respect uh, what they call Occam's razor. You know, you have few degrees of freedom, symbols and um, conventions. And each possibility in a mathematical description should correspond to physical reality. So I think this explanation of one photon Mach Zender experiment corresponds to that. And so if people tell me like, uh, you know, Bell's no go theorem, it says that, you know, you cannot have a classical explanation because then they start blubbering around. My um, answer to that is the same as uh, because they said that once to Einstein, uh, you know, Bell's no go theorem hadn't invented yet, but they said, you know, this is like this uh, theorem in quantum mechanics in the Bohr Heisenberg interpretation and you know what you're saying Einstein is not uh, consistent with that and Einstein said uh, das ist mir wurscht so I don't care um, Einstein of course had more um, uh, status uh, a lot more than I have uh, uh, a zillion times more but um, I, I think uh, his sentiment and the sentiment that I have is someone tells me like, oh, well, this is not consistent, this classical explanation of yours with this or that theorem of an entanglement or confinement or I don't know what this, what, uh, this is what Ehrenfest said, this unendliche uh, Wurstmaschinenphysikbetrieb. Uh, what Einstein, das ist mir wurscht. You know, give me a good theory, a good classical theory that explains the experiment and, you know, whatever mathematical stuff you might come up with, you know, I won't be impressed. And um, so I am not impressed. And uh, and, and this is what it is. And um, I said, uh, have a look at it, read it. And then, yeah, I'll be happy to entertain you uh, when you send me an email. The, the, the email is on, on the papers uh, saying like very concisely, like Jean-Louis, um, this, that, okay that calculation or, you know, this law, energy conservation doesn't apply. Well, I, I think you will need to come up with something very convincing because if, if this theory doesn't work, um, then, you know, it's because uh, I'm violating, uh, you know, the, the very easy theorems um, that have precedence, I would say, over whatever mathematical law you might come up with from the Bohr-Heisenberg interpretation. I'm talking here conservation of energy, talking here conservation of angular momentum, talking here conservation of, you know, uh, electromagnetic fields that don't dissipate away. I'm talking photons being somewhere. Um, I'm talking electrons being somewhere, no, not sort of, I'm not talking wave functions that are associated with some kind of, a, you know, a path integral theory or whatever. No. So um, um, have a look at it. You'll say uh, you're really a crackpot, uh, but then I like to think like a good, bad publicity. Uh, it is publicity. So, um, and I, I, I feel like um, I'm, I'm not over passionate about these things, but uh, it's like what I said with, uh, you know, when you see John Clauser talking plain nonsense, a Nobel Prize winner on an area in which he absolutely has no understanding of uh, being paid by industrial um, uh, lobbies to sort of make statements that everybody believes because he's a Nobel Prize winner in, in science and physics. Uh, sorry, then I'm going like, well, I have a certain right to believe what I believe in. Uh, I invested a lot of time in sort of looking at these things as well, and they make sense to me. Okay, we now go to the um, this controlled double slit uh, electron diffraction. Uh, this is the uh, uh, image of uh, uh, you know the setup that Feynman described in his 1963 uh, lectures. You have an electron gun, uh, so it fires at uh, electrons at a wall. It has there's two slits there. There's a mask behind, a moving mask. Uh, I don't know what that mask is doing actually, but it can move around. Uh, it will slightly influence, I guess, the interference pattern, but I, I should look that up. But then you have a detector, that's important, the backstop that sort of catches, uh, detects uh, the electrons uh, here because it's 1963. Feynman thinks of, you know, uh, one little detector that moves and then, you know, measures and from time to So you need to do a lot of repeated. Uh, um, you need to shoot a lot of electrons, uh, the electron gun. Uh, 
uh, fireman is American and shooting yeah so you shoot these bullets through the to the thing and then you have a detector now it's sort of we have probably uh, you know a backstop that is one large detector so we can catch each and every uh, electron wherever it ends up and um, so in theory uh, that's what Feynman described you have this interference pattern the, the interesting thing about the interference pattern uh, and the way Feynman describes the, the the, the, the experiment is again he, he says this can only be explained if you sort of have a wave function that you know is uh, really from point A to point B we have a trajectory a line and there we will have a wave function and that sort of yeah the distance and the time and different velocity and, and whatever and now we combine these amplitudes uh, that are associated with, with the trajectories in space and uh, we add them all up and then we take the absolute square uh, we square and uh, take the absolute value um, and then uh, you know we arrive at one probability at a certain point in, in time so you go like okay fine uh, you describe this experiment in terms of uh, wave functions attached to um, uh, the trajectories uh, so the, the wave function does not represent the electron uh, in my premise uh, this thing has a structure and the wave function actually shows where the point like charges so i think my my wave function at least does what you know in 1933 uh, you know heisenberg dirac and schrodinger got a nobel prize for is that you know they had a white wave function for the electron not uh, for Feynman's um, uh, what he fully developed as the uh, uh, you know the, the path integral interpretation of quantum mechanics he got a Nobel Prize for that um, I, I think like you know uh, again you know, space-time elasticity doesn't exist uh, hypothetical trajectory in space-time um, you associate a wave function with that um, what does it mean for me this is metamathematical uh, guru like uh, nonsense and uh, I don't mince my word here uh, I, I minced my words a little bit more in previous videos but I'm going like that's not a uh, that's that's a, that's a theory uh, that's a calculation but it's not an explanation I did a paper on that the difference between a theory an explanation and a calculation ideally you know you have a theory that is an explanation and the calculations come all the right you know they show the experiments are true but when you have something that you say okay this is a theory with a lot of calculations but you know the concepts don't make sense and yeah, then uh, then it's not an explanation I, I don't see it happening what Lauren said I, I need to be able to visualize what happens in 3d space and time um, uh, relativistic uh, uh, relativistically correct but if I can't visualize it you know then or what Dirac said then you know then, then you don't understand the equation and if you don't understand the equation and he says that repeatedly like you can't understand these yeah okay then um, then you don't have a good explanation any case to go back so in 2012 finally um, nanometer technology was uh, uh, sufficiently advanced to 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 have what we have there um, so I'll go to that now actually uh, we have that insert here let me look at my, my notes because I did make some notes in that uh, uh, manuscript as well so you have the insert there in the upper left corner and it shows the two slits huh? um, the uh, we have two slits uh, there's a, the, the tiny thing in the middle there you will say we have four slits huh? but the tiny thing in the middle is is just a little support uh, so basically it's two slits one slit uh, top slit below you see the scale there one nanometer um, you see also sort of uh, vaguely that the um, uh, the slits are about uh, 50 nanometer so that's uh, five uh, micrometer so it's micrometer the scale there one micrometer so that's um that's small 50 nanometer wide five micrometers and it's uh, about uh, uh, four uh, uh, micrometer um, uh, tall sorry a nanometer tall so really very small um you should you should take a moment to sort of contemplate the amazing technology and yeah? it's sort of 50 nanometers that's 50 millions of a millimeter so the, the 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 machinery sort of the nanotechnology to produce uh, such fine slits is, is amazing again that scale is it's a lot larger than electrons than the electron scale because there we're talking femtometer so the scale 
slits are actually fairly large as compared to the, the scale of the electron. But um, that's again, you know, you have the same thing. Water molecules are fairly small compared to a slit. You will have an interference pattern when you send water waves through to fairly large uh, slits. So um, that's where I'm going like, um, it's no, not a problem. Also an electron, we, we have the, 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 the interference radius, I would say the, the scattering radius. But again, we have the electromagnetic field, which keeps the, the, the charge in place. So yeah, all kinds of uh, things can happen when an electron goes past there and, you know, starts messing. With the corners around the corners in the middle you know it, it uh, we should imagine these slits you know it's not empty space between the slits you have uh, fields um, surface fields so funny thing is you send a photon through see where it ends up and i'll, I'll show you how these interference patterns build up um ah the mask there the mask there of Feynman where i said like okay um what is it doing there the mask will partially or fully uh, cover uh, one of the slits so then you know we move that mask and then we cover a uh, slit one uh, up and then we only have one slit and this is where I'm going actually this is the most interesting part which Feynman does not develop it, it's like uh, you know these amplitude waves uh, makes a lot of sense where you say like okay fine we have a certain phase of something going through slit one and then something is going through slit two and it's moving around certain frequency orbital linear whatever um you know and it sort of messes with the other thing that comes through so they come sort of together and then you know you have interference between the two but the nice thing is that uh, this is the, the magic behind it is even if we have only one slit um we will have interference and uh, and the nice thing is also even if we have, if we have the two slits you know and one electron at a time with sufficient space to ensure that you know one electron cannot catch up with the other or something weird no uh one f electron at a time we will still have an interference pattern where i'm going like okay that that should be easy to explain in terms i mean it's not easy to explain it's very complicated but uh, you know that electron has a certain structure and various frequencies you know and an angular momentum and a magnetic moment and that sort of goes around and has a certain oscillation um but it's regular that motion various dimensions so yeah somehow you know when you force it through a slit um and it goes through it um then um sometimes it doesn't go through it this thing also where it or sometimes the electrons uh, hit part of the of the wall and uh, just bounce back so you already have a variation and uncertainty in where this electron is going so and that uncertainty is to do with initial conditions of that electron when it gets fired out of the electron jet. But the regularity is there. We don't know the initial conditions of how that oscillation exactly goes through. But the fact that it goes through and shows up and interacts and interferes with the material of the slit, uh, that should not be a surprise. So, um, but they made that mask. Okay, so let's go um, uh, fire one by one because that's what they're doing. Huh? Mm -hmm. So then we have the buildup of this uh, pattern. Um, should I really show you what? So you have here, um, I think one, one slit is wide open and you see one by one and there's a huge detector plate, uh, maybe a film, I guess. Um, so where, uh, when an electron hits it, um, you know, it, uh, it makes a, a little mark on the, I guess that sort of film uh, plate, photofilm. And so then you see indeed up, um, you know, that it forms like uh, if you one by one and you wait and uh, 20 minutes, you know, or I think it's something like that, a half an hour. You have these um, like galaxy, uh, five galaxies. Uh, so it's an interference pattern, all right? You, you have areas where it's more intense and less intense. The one thing I immediately see here when you look closely at this picture, it's not the interference pattern that uh, Feynman predicted from his theoretical uh, I would say uh, wave functions that he um, um, associates with the length and the time uh, then uh, the electron needs to travel to point x uh, on the uh, on the detector screen no it's sort of like um, i call that an airy pattern it's sort of like the the yeah it's more intense than one area and then less intensity uh, less impact um, of, of less electrons in, in another area but it's sort of not the, the, the kind of neat um, separation that Feynman had predicted. Another thing in, in Feynman's theory, which struck me, 
if you go to Feynman's lecture, is uh, he goes like, oh, well, we have bosons and fermions, and for bosons, you know, you need to uh, add the amplitudes, and for electrons, uh, you know, because they are fermions, you need to subtract the amplitude. Well, like as soon as you have like two or three, you know, interactions between fermions, you know, what do you do with your minus sign? You get all kinds of weird stuff. And it gets confirmed because in his theoretical explanation, he adds amplitudes. He does. He sort of forgets about his theory of fermions, uh, you know, where you need to subtract uh, amplitudes. But that's another thing. But in any case, the, the, the pattern you get in a 2012 experiment is not sort of the neat interference pattern that, um, that Feynman gets. So that's probably because Feynman model is too simplistic and, and not sort of takes into account all the complexities that you have when a complex uh, structure like an electron if you think of it as a ring current you know uh, going around it gets there and the 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 other thing is um here we have it eh? you see in the in the in the left hand corner that mask uh probably you need to look really carefully eh? so you have that a piece of material and you have that yellow uh, thing uh, moving from left to right the mask uh on that piece of material and then you know you see how one slit opens if that yellow piece of material moves more right uh, one uh, top hand um second three we see one split there okay and then it moves sufficiently um to the right to have two splits fully open and then um you know the mask is moving even more and then it starts closing the first split and at the bottom, you know, uh, the two uh, slits are closed again because the mask, uh, which consists of two pieces, has moved completely to the other side and now covers uh, the two slits. Fine. Now look, look, look at what it produces. So that's basically, um, you know, for each of these situations where we have either one or two slits fully open or partially open. Uh, this is sort of the pattern you get and you can see uh, if one slit is open yeah it's kind of interference uh, you know we have a zone of intensity and then you know it gets on the sides we have like secondary um, and these when you have two splits you can clearly see that there are multiple blobs of, uh, of light um, yeah interesting of course uh, but again this is not sort of the, the neat interference pattern for me it's um, it's like this you know when you send photons and this is this is from the 19th century uh, when you look through a, a, a lens or something when you said and you will have diffraction uh, because that's what you have with this uh, split experiment the the electrons uh, that go through it it's, it's basically diffraction i don't call it interference um, it's a diffraction phenomenon uh, you have something going in a straight line it goes through a split and then it sort of um, you know produces an interfere which is a diffraction pattern and you have a zone of intensity much in the center and then you have different rings around it you know this is just like a pin pin needle like um, a point through which you send photons and so you will have a pattern like that yeah with a with a with a clear uh, center which is very intense and then this is a computer generated image of a very uh with with um you know the, the blue is more intense than the red um so it's it's a it's a it's a more intense um zone of uh, of uh, of where you know the photons hit and in between you have less intensity uh but it's it's not um it's not sort of that neat uh, sinusoidal thing sort of the zones uh, cross each other and um and that's where i'm going like um, you know for me this this uh, electron interference there's uh, nothing that uh, makes it look any different than than photon interference than light beam interference or, or even water molecules that you would send to one or two splits so um again that's where i'm thinking like uh, why do we need um this again mathematical humbug of uh, you know associating the wave function not with the electron uh, as i do here you know this ring current that's Euler's number times an imaginary exponent and uh, that will represent where that point light charge is at any point in time we can't of course because we don't know the initial condition is it here or has or is it there um, but we know it's either here or it's there or it's somewhere in between it depends on the initial conditions which we can never know because this oscillation is so fast but we know that uh, you know this is our problem we can't we can't measure the initial conditions 
because we destroy the system or, or you know it's too fast for our measurement apparatus or whatever but it's not an uncertainty in nature uh, it is it is a deterministic system and then indeed if sort of um, you know an electron uh, you should you can give it a certain velocity yeah? you can accelerate it it has a high velocity so that injects a lateral component it changes the structure of that ring current so for me there's no um, there's no um, no no big mystery um the speed of light is speed of light so the point like charge you know it's uh, we had a linear component to its motion because we fire it through so uh, some of the light like yeah, you know it's, it's it doesn't do the original orbit anymore and um you, you will have uh, um you know something that is uh, gives a regular diffraction pattern um and um for me there's no mystery did i work out the, the math of that no i didn't uh, did anyone work out the math? No, not even for photons. You know, the, what you have for uh, photons is, uh, or for beams, is what they call the Huygens Fresnel uh, equations. And they distinguish between the near field, which is, uh, you know, really particle like uh, uh, mass, and then the far field, where indeed you have sort of wave like uh, a diffraction pattern. And, uh, and if you look at it, this is sort of a mathematical simplification in the sense that, you know, the slit, they will think of it as having a number of, uh, uh, like an array of, uh, of, of, of oscillators that then send out wave and based on that. And so it's, it's full of um, hypotheses that somehow model, you know, the complexity of the situation and do arrive at a solution for the, the, for the far field. But what happens in the near fields, and I have a paper on that, is uh, practically impossible to, um, um, to describe um, but again we were optimistic we think it can be done um, and this might be a PhD thesis in its own but we, we feel like uh, you know there's nothing inside of us that says like oh this is impossible to explain classically I'm going like you know an electron as soon as you sort of stop thinking that it's a, a point like uh, it is point like but, but that it has zero dimension while well, you damn well know that it has a magnetic moment, you know, that have a certain interaction radius, that it has a certain radius, and the photons, you know, hit it, and that that's, you know, a few femtometers, well, 386 femtometers. So that's, you know, it, it has a dimension, it has a structure, it's like a disc-like thing, as far as we know from, from scattering experiments. So that, and that, that you know, hits the sites and, and whatever, it's a, it's a regular, complicated, um, structure but it's uh yeah. At atoms and molecules when you force them to split you know they will also have a complicated structure and the pattern that uh, that you get there will also become some kind of regular diffraction pattern because i find you know the one slit eh, there's so much uh, two slits um, we send one electron to and then somehow is it the electron that goes through both slits at the same time yeah, this is fucking nonsense you have one uh, slit uh, and, and there's a diffraction pattern so start by explaining that before you you know complicate matters when we have two slits you know it doesn't make a big difference you know the second slit reproduces um, the, the the pattern of the first slit if you would have the second slit comb but just you know shift it a little bit and then you superpose these two diffraction patterns and you you see what you see in these experiments so first go to the one slit experiment and try to uh, you know classically come to something similar as the the Huygens Fresnel equations for um, diffraction of light and uh, it looks the same um, so it looks the same the structures you know mathematics behind it are the same so um, you know if, if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck uh, it might be a duck eh? I mean the chances are big that it's a duck so I think of this this uh, uh, electron scattering or diffraction experiments or interference same thing you know we're looking at a duck here um just explain how the duck uh, flies and uh, and works so um but again that would be a nice uh, phd thesis because i think uh, you know a decent quantitative explanation as opposed to the qualitative explanation that i'm giving here would uh, would sure make uh, waves uh, <laughs> we're talking waves uh, well, yeah, PhD on this that gives, as well I said, the, the equivalent of Huygens Fresnel equation. It, it, it would make waves. Um, yeah, this is one other. I started like drawing, you know, things that uh, 
uh, bounce around in a split that have some more angular momentum and then trying to think how you can add a linear component and, and what kind of um, it doesn't matter this is from the old days uh, but it should be something like that you know we, we should be creative if you look at how an, an electron uh, the trajectory in a penning trap you know we can trap an electron in a penning trap um, yeah, it's a pretty complicated trajectory it's very beautiful uh, it's like a desert rose um, uh, song of sting the um, yeah and that's uh, you don't need any uh, weird uh, metaphysical things to 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 imagine uh, what might be going on this is a slide I um, I showed already but I would like to conclude I show the invariance of the the wave function argument there um, again that diagram uh, again I can't thank a, a group of uh, Italian researchers under Francesco Celani they busy with cold fusion I wrote on cold fusion I'm, I'm slightly skeptical but the the advantage of these uh, scientists is that they uh, they think like me uh, you know there must be an explanation and it must be physical and uh, it's not this um, this uh, metaphysical uncertainty principle that you you can't do anything with that um, I put there that the, the yeah the big mistake in quantum physics you know 720 degrees arise when uh, you don't realize that you know when you model everything as spin zero while at the same time saying like you know bosons or fermions you know these metaphysical categories these are spin one and a half then what is spin defined spin what magneton are you using and etc etc you know what unit um, so there's a lot of hocus pocus there uh, I won't go into that I put my two equations there for the electron radius and the proton radius I'll probably finish with those um, this is again where I say like you don't need a, and for me this is a, people say this is numerology uh, Planck Einstein relationship energy is h bar times an orbital frequency um, and then writing an orbital velocity uh, at speed of light um, as a as a radius times an orbital frequency for the electron that's the subscript here uh, you know I I can rewrite that uh, e is h bar um, omega relation uh, rewrite it equate it um, uh, by saying okay the omega must be equal to uh, the, the the radius of my electron divided by light speed I get it from the orbital velocity formula and must also be equal to um, um, h bar divided by the energy I'm taking the inverse of omega here so then I replace the energy um, by mc square the mass of an electron as a whole but I write it here as two times the effective mass of that point like charge inside of an electron again saying like you know the half is kinetic energy so that's the efficient mass and then uh, the other half is the electromagnetic field so the um, the mass of the electron as a whole uh, the uh, which is the inertia to change of the state of motion of that electron as an energy packet uh, it's the Breuer's original formulation of, uh, of matter particles energy packets that uh, looks like that h bar uh, mc square which is two times the efficient mass of that point like charge and then I arrive at my um, Compton radius and um, this is then the wave function I said I think of um, the wave function Euler's number and that complex exponential there um, plus or minus is the spin direction the imaginary unit is a rotation operator and sort of designates the plane in which the, the ring current uh, is there or the, os the oscillation uh, the frequency um, or the phase argument is uh, the energy divided by h bar uh, so that's the, the frequency uh, from the e is uh, h bar times omega you know I get there uh, the imaginary unit times the frequency times the time so that tells me where the phase is and it tells me where the point like charge um, is if I would know the initial condition so it's sort of a vague uh, it's somewhere but it that shows this equation shows that my point like charge is somewhere at any point in time here there somewhere in between it's not something smeared out so this wave function interpretation of the electron is uh, is that's that's what it says 
Um, the interesting thing is for the proton, I've been thinking about that sort of how do you have the wave function of a proton? We have one for an electron. I thought about that a lot. In the beginning, I had sort of like, okay, I know the radius. Uh, it's, it's four times uh, because we have a different Planck-Einstein relation. We have one oscillation, one direction, then it's a three-dimensional oscillation. So there's a four factor there that comes with uh, the form factor. Uh, it's it's a, an orbital equation. We think of a sphere. So you have that factor four that appears in, you know, when you calculate angular momentum uh, of a disk versus, uh, you know, just a plain circle, the, the circumference of a circle versus the, 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 the surface of a sphere or the Gaussian factor when you, that you have when you consider 3D space and how radiation spreads out and the energy density. So you have that four factor or four pi factor. So I have the radius, but then how do I sort of my the time dependent part? Uh, that's uh, well, there's number again plus uh, I think okay we have one plane the ring current, but we have another plane of oscillation. So in the beginning, and this is a mistake from previous lectures, I sort of split it up. I said like we have Euler numbers time plus or minus uh, the imaginary unit times half the frequency, half the energy, plus J. Um, taking it from Hamilton's pure quaternion math. So if we have I as a rotation operator, we can think of a J, uh, which uh, we rotate in one plane, we rotate in the other plane, and you know, the mathematical condition is the same. Uh, uh, rotating two times should bring us, uh, I mean, rotating two times 90 degrees brings us to minus one as a sort of position. Rotating uh, in the other plane two times 90 degrees also brings us to from plus one to uh, minus one here it's plus one minus one you know we rotate like this 90 degrees uh, another time so we have i square we arrive at minus one we rotate in the other plane you know uh, 90 degrees 180 degrees we also arrive at minus one and then the funny thing is uh, we have this uh, the third imaginary unit in hamilton system which i think is beautiful is a k square and it's okay as another plane but it's a special plane it's not a uh, just uh, because you have two planes already, you know, you have actually a 3D thing. So um, K is a special one. When do you need it? It's also going to be a rotation operator. Uh, you know, so K square brings you to minus one. But the beauty of, um, of K is that uh, it's the product of uh, I and J. So the two imaginary units, when we multiply them, we have i square is a minus one, j square is minus one, k square is minus one, but i times j is k. And if we reverse it, it's non-commutative, we get minus k. And this is very interesting because you could imagine that, you know, we have, let's say, the electric fields, you know, a circularly polarized photon. So that forms like a plane. Let's call that the i plane. And then we have the magnetic field vector that, you know, also sort of, uh, you know, rotates in a plane. So we could say like, okay, the electric um, field, uh, you know, because the electric field that goes around and around in the I plane and the magnetic field vector goes around in J plane. So sometimes we'll need like a linear combination of that. Uh, it's not that easy. I'm giving an example, but sometimes we would need to multiply, you know, two forces, huh? uh, two orthogonal forces. We would take a vector cross product or whatever. That, that's sort of where, especially when these planes then in themselves move, you know, the electric field vector can go in one plane. But I said for a proton, we're thinking like a, an oscillation in three dimension. That's where that K uh, is, is actually an idea. I still need to work it out, but I would write the wave function of a proton like that now. Uh, the radius is four times h bar divided by the uh, uh, equivalent mass of the of the energy uh, in the proton times c times that uh, indeed the k the k plane is uh, is not very well defined in terms of the coordinate frame uh, it depends really you know if we if this proton uh, moves in free space or in some kind of electromagnetic field it will uh, it will do a weird dance and the k must be uh, related to um, you know, to, to planar oscillations and, uh, and how they're related is exactly product. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, but, but I think quaternion math will, will be very helpful. Uh, I think I, um, I'm finished with that. I uh, hear it's sort of, um, yeah, but I won't go into detail on that. That's sort of, uh, atomic orbitals. Um, I, in my lecture number 10, if you go on research gate, I have an annex that I think you should read. It analyzes uh, Schrodinger's equation and the spherical solutions it derives at because I thought that will be handy 
um, for the for the proton and uh, I rewrite the Bohr the first Bohr orbital here in a, in a wave function notation that differs a little bit from Feynman's and I think mine uh, makes more sense because I deconstruct a bit uh, Feynman's interpretation of the s orbitals in hydrogen atoms and uh, believe it or not uh, go through it and uh, send me your feedback oh yeah I should not talk about that the the whole thing that I have so I have a theory for for matter here I have one for antimatter it's a fairly simple one but I should talk about that a little bit because the you know proton again it's also like a point like charge oscillating in uh, two planes uh, or in three dimensions instead of two or one plane only uh, as for the electron the um, the point like charge in in a proton uh, is is different from the point like charge in an electron um, why uh, not because it's positive uh, and, and, and negative it, it also goes for an antiproton and a positron you know the anti electron the, the the shape of an antiproton an antiproton electron they won't annihilate each other because their shape and structure is very different an electron and a positron do a proton and antiproton do but the, the main point is that um, you know a proton is much smaller than the uh, the, the classic and electron radius that I calculate because in electron we have said it's a point like charge its dimension is um, is uh, is the Compton radius but uh, you know the anomaly and the magnetic moment I explained that is sort of indicates that that point like charge sitting around and an electron has some dimension of its of its own and we know what it is it's the fine structure constant or well the inverse of the structure constant sorry no the uh, it's one divided by 137 uh, uh, um, uh, times the Compton radius so it's actually uh, it has a size and the, the remarkable thing is actually that size of the point like charge in an electron itself is actually larger than the proton it's a very proton is very dense and so if you think of a point like charge uh, it's a unit charge a positive charge plus one uh, in a point uh, it's a lot smaller than, than the proton and um, I arrive at sort of because these these calculations are fairly rough huh, uh, on a proton because it's so small the anomaly you know the precision with which it's 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 measured the anomaly in the in the protons magnetic moment is a lot less than the precision um, of, of the measurement of the anomaly in the magnetic moment of the electron so the um, well, what we have is the point like charge in a proton is much smaller but I calculate well like 1.2 percent only of the radius of a proton but the proton is itself much smaller than um, the uh, the classical electron with the point like charge in an electron and the electron then itself so you see you have the scale and what you clearly see is that the point like charge in in a proton or an antiproton must be something very different for for me that sounds logical because you know proton and an anti-electron are two very different things both are positive have a positive unit charge but a, a completely different structure an anti-electron is much larger um uh, has a very different magnetic moment uh, it's reverse uh, because an electron negative charge positive so reverse all the uh, uh, directions of magnetic moment uh, the angular momentum vector axial vectors uh, all, all these uh, get a sign reversal so when you plug in a positive charge instead of a negative charge but still the the, the positive charge in a proton is very different than the negative charge in an anti-electron and also of an antiproton versus and uh, which is negative versus an electron so um so that leaves us with a good explanation of matter and antimatter but the thing is where you know you go like 70 80 percent as they calculated now of the of the universe is dark matter we see that in the way galaxies move and whatever there's a lot of dark matter there doesn't radiate anything out doesn't seem to absorb anything um, but it's there what kind of matter is that and uh, I will talk a little bit about that because the thing I've, that has been intriguing me as a kid a little bit is you know the electromagnetic force and it's the only force we know I will talk about that nuclear force can be reduced to it for according to me um, you know it's left-handed and this is the big thing about all these symmetries is uh, uh, yeah there's a symmetries you know some things are left-handed both are a matter, matter antimatter or some things are just left-handed and according to me it's matter and antimatter they they obey the same uh, left-handedness in the electromagnetic force and I'm thinking like mathematically it's like Dirac uh, when when he sort of predicted the positron he said you know this this this, this math would also work with um, 
with a positive charge and so then later they found a positron and so on and they discovered uh, every matter particle has an antimatter counterpart uh, because the math was, so that this is an example of where theory your mathematical model um, has a possibility in it and i'm going like okay if we would have we could theoretically imagine a right-handed force it's not that difficult you know the magnetic field vector now follows uh, the electric field vector with, with 90 degrees with a phase factor of 90 degrees um, pi over two we could have a right-handed force and that maybe might explain dark matter why am i highlighting it it's just to show that um you know this is very speculative but what is going on now in terms of physicists trying to explain dark matter is hilarious and i laugh out loud well i think we have here a pretty obvious uh, explanation uh, hand if it would be right-handed uh, you know the signature of this force the handshake or whatever would be so different that yeah you can imagine that um, matter and antimatter would would never interact with dark matter or, or the antimatter counterpart of dark matter we would have like uh, a world and a mirror world huh? because if you look in a mirror huh, your right hand if you look at the guy who's facing you you know his his right hand uh, you know it's left to us uh so you get this weird symmetry the middle world is not our world i will, I will show a few um, images on that and i think that's also where classical uh, textbooks on physics on physics when they talk about symmetries um uh, mirror symmetries uh, you know, and, and they have more complicated names for it and parity and uh, and all that the um I uh, should go back to it. It's been years that I looked in sort of the symmetry stuff and, and that kind of stuff. But it, it would make uh, sense. But um, as I said, we're one hour. I want to finish within two hours and I want to get it done. So I'll continue. Ah, the big gap, uh, not sort of entry force, is uh, you will say, okay, you have electrons and protons. What are neutrons then? Uh, this is the thing where, uh, you know, in mainstream physics will tell you, well, you know, we have uh, quarks and then. And, uh, neutrons are a uh, discomposition of quarks eh? and then I'm going like uh, hello a neutron is not a stable particle it is only inside of the nucleus uh, that, it, that it's stable eh? and deuteron you know you can't have two protons without a neutron you know we go from hydrogen directly to deuteron two protons one neutron uh, we don't have like the the, 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 the forces uh, repulsive forces between two protons are enormous and so you need some kind of glue to hold these together what better glue would there be if we would have some temporary particle that becomes stable in a nucleus a neutron which consists of an, a positive and a negative charge we dance around each other and so that was schrodinger also he had like a platz wechsel, wechsel model uh, for for the nucleus where he said be a proton and a neutron they're in some kind of dance where the neutron becomes a proton and proton becomes a neutron and and there's some kind of electron uh, he wasn't wrong about that according to me the only mistake he made is that um you know i said an electron is much larger than a proton and much larger than a neutron so we must really be thinking in terms of these zeta bewegung charges positive negative uh the the charge inside of uh, of, of these things and then yeah a neutron should be um uh, some kind of combination, a neutral current, some kind of combination of a positive and a negative charge. How it looks, uh, it might have different shapes. Uh, you see these uh, these pictures here. Uh, analytically, this is very difficult to model. You know, you know, then the three body problem uh, is already impossibly to solve, um, impossible to solve analytically. So this is two body problem, especially when you look inside. You know, it would be stable inside the nucleus only. Uh, outside of the nucleus, you know, a neutron just falls apart in a proton and an electron um, and their joint masses are actually uh, or energies are, are lower than the combined energy uh, inside of a neutron which which explains why a neutron is not stable you know it it loses energy it sheds binding energy by by, by disintegrating into a proton and a neutron uh, an electron so um but that's the hypothesis and i have a paper on that do we need a nuclear force uh, i don't think so i, I said the magnetic force and was inspired also by an Italian researcher that you know when when you think of charges spinning around at uh, at the speed of light the magnetic uh, force becomes a force to be reckoned with uh, so to speak uh, as important as the electrostatic forces of uh, attraction and repulsion you have the same orders of magnitude and that's where you go like uh, well that's uh, that's as strong as the 
presume nuclear force which uh, Yukawa invented and Yukawa's force has a lot of uh, disadvantages I would say theoretically uh, first it's it's not symmetrically it has sort of a short range uh, so you go like okay fine uh, we don't have like something that you know falls off with distance uh, we have uh, uh, cubes and uh, or the cube roots uh, instead of square roots or squares uh, and there's a lot of other stuff. You also think like if you have a nuclear force, a uh, force must act on something. I said that. Uh, uh, and the electromagnetic force acts on a charge. Uh, and we know a charge is measured in a unit, Coulomb. Uh, nuclear force, well, if you have a nuclear force, then you must have a nuclear charge, right? So then we would have like, besides the electric charge, uh, plus or minus one Coulomb, uh, a nuclear um charge unit uh, and i joke in this paper do we need the nuclear force about well we could call it the einstein einstein doesn't have a unit yet he actually has one but it's something in photosynthesis or we could call it the dirac or uh, we could call it the, the yukawa or uh, i could call it the van bella because i'm thinking of a unit for yukawa's force any case that's a big joke because if you start writing that out um, you, you get very funny uh, a dimensional formulas in which basically uh, you know all indicate like uh, there, there's no such thing as, as a different nuclear charge uh, it, it all goes back into these old uh, electromagnetic field formulas and the coulomb is all what we need they they fall away so um a nuclear force uh, it's an unattractive hypothesis for me because i said the um we can imagine again uh, the detailed equations of motion there as they are called it and we need the equations of motion uh for high energy reactions uh, no i don't have these equations of motion but uh, you know i can see them the orders of magnitude in the calculations i do which i basically take from that i said an italian research i forgot his name now uh, which shows sort of magnetic fields how how strong they become at close range and especially when charges move at light speed uh, it all makes sense to me and uh, it explains without partons or uh, or quarks that you why why a, a neutron would be stable inside of the nucleus because it would indeed be sort of that glue and um, yeah we have two positive and, and two negative charges you know in a, in a very complicated dance uh, that respects the planck einstein relationship uh, sort of um, the, all these oscillations pack uh, one or more units of planck's quantum of action or angular momentum and um, and there you go so um yeah again on the mirror world maybe the um so we know the, the, the mirror world doesn't exist because if we look at the mirror world, you know, there's a number of phenomena that depend on uh, left-handed neutrinos um, or, or left-handed uh, other particles, whatever. If you see these nuclear reactions or other reactions in the mirror, you know, these uh, left-handed things become right-handed. Um, this is actually for the force as a whole, you know, we, we know the electromagnetic force is left-handed. And in the mirror, it comes like right handed. You will say, oh, well, that doesn't exist the right handed electromagnetic force. So the, wor the, the, the world in the mirror cannot possibly exist. Um, maybe. Uh, I'm thinking, like, well, dark matter, we, we don't have an explanation for anywhere. Maybe that's the, the world in the mirror. It doesn't interact. You know, we cannot walk in there. Uh, we cannot walk into the mirror. And the guy in the, who looks at us from the mirror, you know, he's us, but he cannot come out of his whole world. And, with his left hand shake our right hand to see that we're basically one and the same uh, it doesn't work we have a mirror world and uh, we can't walk into it but maybe that mirror world um, exists uh, i said this is another diet this is from Feynman where he shows like in nature we have a lot of molecules that are left-handed and the right-handed molecules are very rare or, or don't exist so there are a lot of uh, things that are not reversible and has to do with according to me the left-handedness of the electromagnetic force because that's the only force that explains stuff uh, in nature as far as we know um there's a picture uh, like that uh, again where you say like okay if we look in the mirror we think about it uh the right hand my right hand uh, look at the person who stares at me his right hand is on my left side so we have a swap of left and right there um so when you look at nuclear phenomenon with all the complicated rotation movements uh, and 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 spin uh, that gets reversed and uh, some reactions that take place in our world uh, wouldn't take place there because you know some some things are left-handed 
and 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 only work left-handed uh, but some reactions that are not reversible here could could work in the mirror world so um there i go it's a paper i invite you it's the most i mean i call this lecture loose ends um it's a, it's a retirement project uh it's it's fun but it's complicated to think about you know symmetry breaking um but I think symmetry breaking can be explained by thinking in these in these things. I will also um, link it to, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. Uh, we're one minute before the hour, uh, two hours. Um, I'm struggling with one thing. Basically, if you look at my worldview, it is a, it's a mass without mass model, right? We have one force, the electromagnetic force. Gravity is for me, you know, the structure of the universe. It's a, it's a geometric fetcher. It's pseudo force. I'm with Einstein there. Um, I should study Einstein's work, uh, general relativity theory. Um, I haven't done that, but to me it speaks like intuitively, instinctively. You know, um, our universe is not infinite. Infinity doesn't exist. It's closed somehow. Uh, a sphere is a pretty natural um, mathematical thing. So if there's a theory out there. So like gravity is is a geometric fetcher of of uh, of the universe, uh, and and objects masses create their own space. You know all that stuff that speaks to me, and it says like okay, fine. You know I, I I don't feel any urge to question that. So the only force is the electromagnetic force, and it's always uh, you know a grand unified theory. You know gravity. I said no miracle. The only real force in the universe is the electromagnetic force. Uh, mass without mass, uh, the mass of an electron can be explained by this uh, uh, point-like but not infinitesimally small point-like charge that has zero rest mass and by its velocity uh, at speed and the oscillation uh, becomes a, you know, makes the electron an energy packet and the mass of that energy packet is just indeed uh, a measurement, a measure of the inertia uh, to uh, a change in the state of motion of, uh, of the electron as a whole and the point like charge in it. So mass without mass. The only charges that we know are positive and negative charges, which, as I said, may be quite different uh, in a proton and an electron. Um, but both have no rest mass and whatever their, their dimensions might differ. That's why we have electrons and protons and these different structures. Um, but charge, positive, negative, and the antimatter counterpart of that positive and negative charge in an electron and a proton, respectively. The thing that sort of um, uh, makes me think, um, Jean Louis, this is something that is weird, is pair production. A pair, um, you know, an electron and a positron out of gamma ray, um, you know, cosmic rays that enter the atmosphere. Uh, there you seem to have a uh, charge, a positive and a negative charge. So you still have, you know, at the macro level, I would say um, uh, charge conservation, and uh, that's very important. Um, so in a way, at the macro scale, you might say, okay, we, we charge is conserved because we create out of nothing a positive and a negative charge. So the balance of charge is a, is the same. But I'm going like, yeah, but at the same time, we do have a charge and 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 an anti-charge, uh, 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 plus and a minus, and it might go in separate, uh, separate direction. One electron might integrate, uh, you know, an, an atom. The other positron will yeah, annihilate, uh, mix with a... Um, so I'm going like, yeah, it, it, it is something special. We do have um, creation of charge seemingly uh, out of nothing. And it doesn't contradict my mass without mass model, but it, it gives a very different interpretation to... The, the charge conservation law, uh, it becomes like a, a macro uh, law and not a, um, a micro law. My thing is, and I write in this paper, is that maybe there's two possibilities. I think a number of, uh, you know, a lot of these um, matter antimatter uh, reactions, uh, either their creation of mutual annihilation, they, they take place near a nucleus and you have a very sloppy explanation that oh the nucleus is there needed to absorb the excess kinetic energy, um, I don't know, that, that makes me smile. I say there must be something um, um, funny here that they sort of uh, 
but it always happens uh, near a nucleus and then well, what happens with the nucleus is it the same atom and it's different one is there a swap as does a proton change into a neutron i suspect a lot of these experiments actually um, you know are are indeed um, guilty of what i call sloppy accounting the matter antimatter um, uh, annihilation occurs or creation occurs but we're basically proccing these these platzweckel models where a proton you know one becomes a neutron or a neutron becomes a proton so an electron gets ejected or a negative charge or positive charge gets ejected and that sort of explains then how um, you know this um, this matter antimatter gets created there's no new net uh, creation of either positive or negative charges this is in uh, changes uh, in a nucleus that help to explain you know how they interact with these very very highly energetic uh, gamma rays and uh, and so there's no uh, creatio ex nihilo as they said in latin uh, creation of charge out of nothing um, i said although theoretically you know i said the charge conservation law works at uh, macro but even at the micro level i want a micro law uh, at the smallest of scales, I do not believe uh, somehow that a uh, charge gets created out of uh, purely out of field energy. That's what we're talking about. Gamma rays are high energy photons, uh, very high energy photons, um, but they, uh, there's no such thing as sort of a field suddenly turning into charge because if it would it would it would be interesting yeah maybe maybe i'm wrong eh? maybe fields can condense somehow and become charge maybe charge are condensed fields uh, but i don't i don't i don't like that explanation and that's where i'm going like uh, yeah uh, this is another uh, retirement project i want to do cd accounting as i call it, the accounting of particles and charges that happens because a lot of these uh, experiments that are described they need to take place near a nucleus and then what, what happens there really? Uh, nucleus is needed to absorb the excess of kinetic energy that is, uh, I think like that's hocus pocus a little bit. Maybe it's not, maybe these guys are serious and I think they are, huh? but, um, but I said, uh, you know, I get accused of being a crackpot theorist, but I do see that, uh, you know, cold fusion theorists were also, there's, there's been a lot of hanky-panky. I wrote a blog about that, uh, crooks clearly. Yeah, but there's also a lot of serious research going on there in that field, and uh, I give them the benefit of the doubt um, for the for the serious researchers. So um, there's a lot of hype and and whatever and fancy fashionable theory in in, in mainstream physics, and this might be um, yeah a, a branch you know per annihilation and production where I, I see you know may, maybe it is a nuclear process. And in that case, you know, uh, the charge really doesn't get created out of the fields, but, uh, you know, it was already there in the nucleus. There's one exception to that, and that's sort of where you have these uh, photon experiments, high energy photons uh, colliding in each other, uh, which is interesting because I wonder why, you know, the, the photons should also have a very, very small radius, otherwise it wouldn't interact with each other. But you have then also these experiments, even because someone pointed it out to me, hey, these are reactions that take place outside of a, uh, you know uh, far away from a nucleus but i see these experiments also involve like uh, electron beams so they're um, okay it's more difficult to say like oh maybe there's been some sloppy accounting uh, probably not but still it's it's kind of like they, they they don't say where the electrons go uh they can't probably you know you can't measure everything in experiments like that um but maybe there that's some and that that's also where that uh, uh, and this is very very hypothetical where i think like you know maybe some of these electrons turn like inside out uh indeed become like um, maybe some right-handed uh, electromagnetic forces at play uh, a dark matter creation which then because the dark matter would also consist of a positive and negative charge it's just uh, a different force uh, structure that acts upon them. So uh, th this is all very speculative, and maybe you will say that you just ruined it all. Now you're come, you really come across as a crackpot uh, theorist. Uh, I don't care too much uh, because I'm, I'm honest with you. I sort of say this is how I look at the world. Uh, it gives me a lot of satisfaction. I said I think this is really, really my last lecture, and um, um, I would say have fun with it, discover it yourself. The only reason I'm doing this is to save you some time you may say you don't save me a lot of time with a two-hour lecture 
but um, the, the wisdom and experience and uh, and what I learned from uh, from decades of uh, you know reading in the evening and and jotting things on paper and not sleeping very well and in the morning coming up with something that doesn't work, uh, but then you know tuning it and coming back and trying new approaches that do work uh, led me to um, this kind of uh, classical uh, view of the world and uh, and i'm happy with it um, so it gives me a lot of peace um, and uh, i add i'm happy i'm not an academic physicist that i don't have to uh, toe uh, the line and you know uh, to have that pressure to really publish in a journal and then get some because i did that actually my manuscript i sent it i got osp reviewed and i got some silly remarks on typos that were there i thought okay thank you for correcting those typos no constructive or logical or you know none of my arguments was sort of uh, uh, dismantled i would say as i would had um, hoped because i dismantle or i i um i see through some mysteries that sort of you know fine man uh, no it was none of that it's sort of uh, basically vague comments uh, this being numerology or whatever and then some typos and i said that that's then a peer review wow great i don't want any more uh i'm not gonna push it i said i uh, i like to speak for you guys um i would recommend uh, read uh, the lives of brian and it's a wink to um the life of brian from acdc's lead singer brian johnson this guy is brilliant. I understand where he gets the energy from. He's got a fine sense of humor. Um, it learned me a lot. And this guy, uh, this is one of the reasons why I said I'm going to do another lecture. He has performance anxiety. You think like this is the greatest artist on earth, um, entertains 60,000, 100,000 people. And, you know, every time he goes on stage, he has performance anxiety. So that's where I decided, like, I, um, I like to talk. I'm going to do this video and it's going to be my farewell with a big smile to physics and to all uh, you know young students who think that this makes some sense so um have a great weekend and um, i won't see you again um but feel free to mail uh, ask questions uh, i don't have all the answers i think i do cut through a lot of nonsense and uh, as a last event to go back uh, uh, a Dr. John Clauser, you know, a Nobel Prize winner who says climate change don't exist. For me, he does a big um, dishonor to what science should stand for. Uh, science should stand for indeed honestly looking for what makes sense, what could be true. And if you're convinced it's true, then write it out. Um, but that's science. Uh, just joining a, damn it, the CO2 coalition. Climate change is there, uh, and I hope you as a physicist, I, I advise my children to study engineering, or um, my, my daughter is a, is a medical doctor, to make a serious good contribution to the world uh, in the field of science and technology. Uh, Dr. John Clauser is not doing that. Um, I think maybe with my crackpot theories here, I'm making a bigger contribution than he does. Uh, that's what I hope. Okay, this was a very serious remark. Uh, I should cut it out, but I won't. I will push stop and I will upload this video. Bye, guys.